Greetings. Welcome to the Avon Valley Church's Thought for the Day. We are located in a delightful area on the northwest edge of the New Forest. My name is Jeremy. Who do you think is the greatest Britain ever? Possibly Winston Churchill, who had the resolve and passion to rally Britain and her allies to defeat the Nazis in World War II, or maybe a little further back, Admiral Lord Nelson, who beat the combined French and Spanish fleet at the Battle of Trafalgar, or Trafalgar if you prefer, and uh, gave Britain mastery of the seas. Or going back further still, maybe King Alfred the Great, who beat the Danish invaders, gave Britain her constitution and her navy. But maybe none of these. So how should we define greatness? I suggest it is by their legacy, that which they left to us. So we should ask, what did they give us and how long did it last? My selection for the greatest Britain gave us a gift which has lasted for over 500 years. So we take it for granted. It is our English language. But of course, it's no longer ours. It's the common language worldwide of the skies and of the seas. And it's the first or second language of much of the world. The man who, more than any other, created our language as we know it, was put to death by church and state for doing so. His name was removed from our history books by order of the state. We can find him in the list of our national martyrs. His name is William Tyndale. And Melvin Bragg said of him, William Tyndale is the man who brought about more profound change to the English speaking world than any other person in history. It was his English that Shakespeare used. Here's a book of the sonnets of William Shakespeare. It was his English that was incorporated in the King James Authorised Bible. Here's a lovely 1611 Holy Bible King James Version. That's the English we find in those. And of course, the Bible and Shakespeare both was key to our language as we know it. So here is an outline of who he was and what he did. He was a priest in England in the 16th century and in those days the only church was the Church of Rome led by the Pope. The Bible was written in Latin as it had been for a thousand years. The king was Henry VIII. Tyndale was a great linguist and a great scholar so he could easily read the Latin Bible. But the vast majority of people were dependent on priests to tell them what God said. Tyndale thought this was wrong, very wrong. Originally, the Bible had been written in the Jewish language of Hebrew for the Old Testament. And later, this was translated into Greek so all could read it. And in the days of the great empire of Alexander the Great, Greek was the common language. It was still the common language in the time of the New Testament, so that too was written in Greek. But then in AD 313, the Roman Emperor Constantine declared that Christianity should be officially recognised as a religion. By then it was thinly but widely spread throughout Europe. But to keep it as the language of the people, by about 400 AD, St Jerome, translated the whole Bible into the common Latin used throughout the Roman Empire. It was the people's Bible, the Vulgate Bible. But by the time of King Henry VIII, the translation of the Bible was regarded as sacred. This Vulgate Bible in Latin was a sacred Bible. People were told that it was written in God's language. This mystery of the Bible gave the church great power only the priests 
could tell the people its meaning. Sadly, over the years, the Church of Rome needed more money. It told the people that they were all heading to purgatory, but they could buy years of remission from the Pope's pardoners, who sold pardons. They also sold relics of the saints or remission for going on pilgrimages. William Tyndale considered that everybody had an equal right to the word of God in their own language, but the church forbade it. The contents and the mystery of the Bible was theirs to tell. That was their edict. By this time, the church and the state were hand in glove. Henry's chief minister was Cardinal Wolsey. So to translate the Bible into English, or even to read it into English, was decreed as treason. Yet Tyndale stated, If God spare my life for sufficient years, I will enable even a ploughboy to know more of the scriptures than many priests do now. At that time, a survey found that some priests could not recite the creed or the Ten Commandments, and a few of them did not know who composed the Lord's Prayer. Then Martin Luther, in Germany, listed the deviance of the Church of Rome from the teaching of the Bible. This caused an uproar in Europe. King Henry wrote a letter condemning Luther, and the Pope was so pleased that he awarded Henry the title Defender of the Faith. I've got here a coin, ordinary coin, and if you look at it with a magnifying glass, you'll see that on it it says Fid Def, Defender of the Faith. It's there to this day. But then King Henry wanted to put divorce from his first wife, but the Pope forbade it. So Henry simply sacked the Pope from being head of the church in England, and he took the role himself. He demanded that all priests swear loyalty to him as head of the church. Now, my distant ancestor, St John Houghton, was prior of Charterhouse. He had taken his holy vows to the Pope, so he was in a bit of a bind as how he could cope with Henry's oath. So he wrote to the Chancellor and said, this is my dilemma, how shall we proceed? And the Chancellor's office replied, come round and when we can sort it out. He went round, was put on public trial for not taking the oath and hung, drawn and quartered along with several others. And his monks were all put in a cell, they locked the door and they literally threw away the key they all starved to death. Both church and state demanded total, unquestioning obedience in the time of Henry VIII, and that was in 1535. There had been an earlier attempt to produce an English Bible in the 14th century. This was in the time of Chaucer and the Canterbury Tales. And a great scholar called William Whitcliffe gathered a team and the Bible was translated into English from the Latin Vulgate. Now this copy of mine, the spelling has been corrected from those days, but if you just look at the back, how beautifully the handwritten copy is, follows the lines. It was a great work and unfortunately it was very badly received by the state. You see, Young men copied out tracts from this Bible and they taught people about the teaching of the Bible and they were called Lollards. Now, the translation was banned, nearly all of Whitcliffe's Bibles were burnt, the Lollards were hunted down, tortured and put to death by the state and the church. The Lollards, sad to say, being tortured, and in the residence of the head of the church was a torture chamber which can be seen to this day and it is called the Lollard's Tower. William Whitcliffe himself, who organised that edition, he died, but his body was dug up and ceremonially burnt as an example to anyone thinking of writing the Bible in English. Then, 
some 130 years later, William Tyndale formally sought permission to produce an English Bible, but was told that it was heresy to do so. He felt called by God to do it, to give the people of his country a Bible in the language of the people. So he left England, sadly, never to return, and went into hiding for the rest of his life. Initially, he worked in Germany. A great international scholar, whom Tyndale may well have met at Oxford or Cambridge because he went to both, called Erasmus, had just made a well-researched translation of the New Testament in Greek, and Tyndale worked principally from this, as did Luther. So he produced his English New Testament, he found a printer, and had the copies ferried into England by friendly merchants secreting them in bales of cloth. In England, they caused a secret sensation. Thousands of copies of Tyndale's New Testament were published. This was in 1526. They were greatly sought after, but to possess one was treason. Here is my facsimile copy of this New Testament. And this one you'll see inside is now being printed in Tyndale's day and how beautifully this edition is reproduced. So that was the sensation in England if you could get one and stand the risk of what might happen if you were found. The church was outraged. Tyndale was condemned as a heretic and hunted throughout Europe. In London, the bishop bought all the copies of that book that he could find and his agents could find and he publicly burnt them. The people thought it was very strange, a bishop who burns Bibles. It caused lots of publicity for that English Bible, as it had all been paid for by the bishop and Tyndale got the money. He was even more pleased because he could print even more. Later, Tyndale did further research back into the Hebrew and the Aramaic. He was a wonderful linguist, spoke six languages fluently and many more had a working knowledge of and he produced an even better translation in 1532, and that's the translation that we use to this very day. Then Tyndale studied the Old Testament, back through the Greek, further back to the original Hebrew. He first translated the first five books, the Pentateuch. They're really important in part of the Bible, the Moses books. Then by one by one, he translated a further number of books from the Old Testament. I've borrowed this copy just so I can show you. Thank you, David. And uh, this is a copy of Tyndale's Old Testament. So you see, he did a lot of that as well as all the other. But then came calamity. Tyndale was betrayed. He was working with his assistants, who had access to all his translation, but a plausible rogue called Harry Phillips wanted to help him, so he said. He befriended Tyndale and then lured him out for a meal. It was a trap. Tyndale was arrested in 1535. Immediately, one of his assistants, Miles Coverdale, took all he could, scuttled across the channel, translated from the Latin Vulgate Bible, the bits not yet worked on by Tyndall, and then he published the Bible using his own name as Coverdale's Bible. And he got permission from King Henry's right-hand man, Thomas Cromwell, and no mention of Tyndale whatsoever. Now, Coverdale's Bible, the only bit we've got left is the Psalms, which are in the Book of Common Prayer. Sadly, after one year in prison, just over, Tyndale was led out to public execution as a heretic. He was strangled and burnt. And his last, laws, his last words were, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. His final wish was granted, for it was in that same year that Coverdale's English Bible was published. However, Tyndale's other assistant, John Rogers, stayed loyal. Working from Tyndale's notes and scripts, 
he finished the Old Testament and a year later published in England under the pseudonym Thomas Matthew's Bible. Again, there could be no mention of the translator Tyndale. And it was this Matthew's Tyndale Bible that was later republished with the, qu the king taking credit and it was placed in every church in England. The whole Bible as written by Tyndale with a little help from Rogers who've just finished off the last bit of the Old Testament. And it was these later editions of the Tyndale based Bible that William Shakespeare studied. And he used both the language and the phrases so freely in his work. The following century, King James II King James I of England, of Second of Scotland, called the top 50 Bible scholars and ordered them to study all existing English Bibles and then make a new translation. They completed the task in 1611. And this is the one we already referred to, the King James Version. It's the most famous and most copied book on earth, but 93% of its New Testament is as set down by William Tyndale. They could not improve on it. In the Old Testament, from the books that Tyndale had completed, then 85% is still his work. Yet he gets no mention in the credits, and many of the scholars may not have even known who originally translated the version that they chose. After all, the church had branded him a heretic and had murdered him. So he was removed from history. Yet Tyndale wrote the common language of the people and used his great gifts to create text that is to this day a delight to read and hear. He used short words and action-packed sentences, simple phrases and superb clear flowing English such had never before been written. You'll recognise some of his phrases. See the writing on the wall. Cast the first stone, the salt of the earth. Fight the good fight from strength to strength. The blind leading the blind, sick to death, broken hearted, the powers that be. You can go on and on. There are so many more. If you'd like to hear a little of Tyndale's translation, as he would have spoken it. He went up into a mountain and when he was set, his disciples came unto him and he opened his mouth and talked them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Sounds familiar, sounds almost like a countryman, but that's as it would have sounded if Tyndale himself was reading it. Thank you for sharing these thoughts on Tyndale. For me, he was England's greatest hero. I think, hope you agree. God be with you. Goodbye. Mm -hmm.